Well, good evening, folks. We want to go ahead and give Dr. Martin a full hour. So come on in, grab your seat, and, uh, and I'll pray for us, and, and he'll just get started, hit the ground running. So please join us in prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you so much for your grace in our lives. Um, thank you for general revelation you gave us, but also the special revelation you gave us in Jesus Christ. Lord, there is salvation in no one else, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we are so thankful for that. And pray that you would help us, Lord, tonight, that we would listen, that you would give us ears to hear, that you would help Dr. Martin to be able to say exactly what he needs to say, and uh, encourage us once again to trust your word above all things. In your son's name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Dr. Martin. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. We're glad to be back. And uh, be with you all again. I'm starting to take a mental roll of who are the backsliders and who are consistent. Most everybody's here. And uh, so we're just, um, we're going to show that video clip uh, right away after I show slide two on the dinosaur tissue. So, because I forgot last week, but the men have it all rigged up here, so the sound is going through your system, so that's good. And the big question is, um, who do we believe? Do we believe God, or do we believe people? Uh, do we prefer the words of God, or the words and opinions of people? So that's, that's our overriding question as we're going through these four weeks. So do you uh, believe God or, for instance, Charles Darwin, since our subject is the creation-evolution controversy? Deep down in your heart, who do you really believe? All right, now I'm going to try to get over to the uh, clip on the dinosaur tissue and this has been around now for about 25 years. And the, this clip comes from 60 Minutes, and word had gotten out that they found uh, unfossilized dinosaur bones. And so 60 Minutes decided, well, word is out, uh, we better do something. So they made this show, but the whole goal of the show is to get you over to thinking, whoa, I mean, if they found soft tissue and red blood cells, maybe they can find some dinosaur DNA and make a dinosaur. So the whole emphasis is to get you past the fact it's impossible. You can't have uh, red blood cells 68 million years later, okay. But to get you past that, uh, they want you to think about having a dinosaur. Okay, so here we go. We're going to try it. Sending the insides to Mary Schweitzer has landed the two of them at the center of one of the biggest controversies yeah. paleontology has seen in years. Okay, paleontology, that's fossils. And this is in Montana, and uh, they found this huge uh, T Rex fossil, and the bones were so heavy they couldn't pull it out with their helicopter, and you couldn't get trucks in, it was so remote. So they had to section the bone. Now, paleontologists do not do that to their bones, okay? They keep them just like they found them. So here we go. 2000, with a series of coincidences, a member of Jack's team, Bob Harmon, wandered away from a dig site one day to eat lunch and noticed a small piece of bone sticking out of the side of a 50-foot cliff. I could tell pretty much what it was from where I was sitting. That it was a... T-Rex metatarsal. How was it sticking out? You mean it was the side, here's a cliff, and it was like a little jutting out? Yep, exactly. He got a folding chair, and he stacked it on these rocks right there. And you can see that this is on the sheer side hill of a cliff. By the way, we need Christian paleontologists, okay? Obviously, you have to know how to balance also, but we do. Uh, that you'll report things honestly. This is not possible. No, is he attached to anything? No, he's not. That's Bob. Jack named the T-Rex B-Rex in Bob's honor and made the decision to dig it out. But this was under 50 feet of rock. Okay, so here you have in Montana a dinosaur that got caught in some sort of a massive mud flow because there's still 50 feet sedimentary above it 
And we don't know how much more there could have been because there's all kinds of uh, bits of it washed off. Maybe it was 100 feet. This was a mudslide in Montana. Is there an ocean nearby? No. This was the flood of Noah's day, pushing these massive mud flows all over the world. Place. There was no road to it. There was no access to it. And so for the next three summers, we sent out climbing crews, people that could repel down cliffs with jackhammers. I mean, it was a horrendous undertaking. The site was so remote that bones had to be lifted out by helicopter. But the giant cast containing B. rex's thigh bones was too heavy. The chopper couldn't get it off the ground. So after all that excavating, Jack gave the order to cut one of B. rex's femurs in two. Now that was heartbreaking. No, well, not really. I mean, get a chance to see inside. Yeah, no, nobody had done that before. And when they cut inside, it even smelled like decaying flesh. He shipped the bone fragments that fell out to Mary Schweitzer. So the first piece I pulled out, I picked it up and I looked at it and I said, it's a girl and it's pregnant. That's the first time, as I understand it, that anyone had ever been able to identify Sexy gender. Dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, that's because nobody had ever looked here before. In any dinosaur? Yes. Mary recognized a specific type of bone called medullary bone, which female birds produce when they're about to lay eggs. Uh, we could say a lot about that, but there's misinformation in here too. But they want you to start thinking dinosaurs gave birth to birds. Okay, so they want you to start thinking that way. Found it before in a dinosaur. It was yet another link to birds, and it meant that B. rex was definitely no Bob. So we have another link to birds from the dinosaurs. Okay. Okay, what are the other links? Somebody name me one. There are no links. Okay. Uh, that's just the way it is. Calls up and says, we have Medi medullary bone. Oh, now this had to be thrilling. Yes, that is very exciting. And that wasn't all. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast, and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. That's this dinosaur tissue. No. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. Yeah. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. See, they know it's impossible. They know it's impossible, but they can't, they just can't say it because they aren't going to believe the Bible. So you see this and you think, what? You see, I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> now, why wouldn't she want to tell anybody? Sending the insides to Mary Schweitzer. Well, what did it do? I must have hit the wrong thing. Anyway, uh, she wouldn't want to tell anybody because you can't have that. You can't have soft tissue in a fossilized, it should have been solid rock. If she tells somebody, they're going to think, oh, you messed up, you messed up. And so I'll see if I can find our place. At the... The site was so than anyone had ever been able to identify gender yeah. in any dinosaur. Yes. Mary recognized us. We'll get there. We have Medi medullary bone. Oh, now this had to be thrilling. That yes. wasn't all. Very exciting. And that wasn't all. Okay. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast, and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. Okay, now you've seen that. Expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this, and you think, what? You see, I didn't you want to tell that. anybody. <laughs> that you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. 
things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. No, they don't look suspiciously like blood vessels. They are blood vessels. Okay. <laughs> she finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. How Ooh, could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells. No, they don't seem to be intact cells. They are intact cells. They're bone cells. Pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science. That organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Mary, Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. Critics said their samples might have been contaminated or that the supposed blood vessels were actually something called biofilm, a type of slime. Now they've since proven it. Nope, it isn't biofilm. It's the wrong amino acids. But as Mary showed us, she's been able to replicate her findings. These are pieces of an even older dinosaur, a well-preserved 80 million year old duckbill. Now they know that one was 80 million years old. They dug it up, there was a little sign on there that said, I'm 80 million. When she dissolved it away in acid. Let's put this under the scope here. Well, look, is that a blood vessel? This is a blood vessel. You see the branches right there? And look at all of them. And it's so consistent over and over and over again. We do this bone and it comes out and I get excited every time. I can't help it. I mean, 80 million years old. No, 4,400 years old. It was at the flood of the days of Noah. Mary published her new results last spring. And while some of her critics have been swayed, the controversy still rages. And the stakes are high. If blood vessels can survive 80 million years, what about DNA? Uh -huh. Jack Horner is looking. His crews are now wearing surgical gloves, unheard of in the world of paleontology, where no one used to worry about getting skin cells, sweat, even an occasional spilled beer on fossils. Jack is skeptical that the full dinosaur DNA sequence will ever be found, but that hasn't stopped him. He's come up with a whole new idea for his dream of making a dinosaur. The best way is just to use a modern dinosaur, the chicken. Mm because evolution works, birds are actually carrying ancestral DNA. Horner has written a new book proposing a plan to mine that ancestral DNA as a way to reverse engineer a chicken into what he calls a dino chicken. It may seem imp So I wanted you to see that clip and this chicken, which is not a dinosaur, okay. <laughs> but the fact is that's been around for 25 years. How many of you have seen that before? See, you're not allowed to see these things. We live in Satan's world system. It's based on deception. So anything that shows, whoa, maybe these billions of years aren't right, you're not allowed to know about it. That's why we did all our DVDs. We'll bring some more next week. We, we were in a hurry. We didn't get it loaded up uh, just right this time. Okay, now I'm going to jump back to where we are. And uh, hopefully... And we're going to go here, and then we're going to jump to slide 215. Some more on dinosaurs, okay? What about dinosaur fossils? Uh, they are real. There's real bones that have been there that died in the flood of Noah, Noah's day. Uh, were dinosaurs on Noah's ark? Well, yeah, God brought two of every kind of animal. So, yeah, they would have been on the ark. Uh, we don't have things like that anymore because we're in a different kind of a heaven and earth system. Second Peter 3 tells us that. The first heaven and earth system was destroyed at the flood of Noah's day. I believe before that there was some sort of water canopy around planet earth. Uh, what does it say right there in Genesis chapter 1? How does that read? When God said down there about verse 6 or 7, uh, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. What's a firmament? If you go to verse 20, it's where the birds fly around. So God put a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. 
That word waters is a dual noun in the Hebrew, which means there's two bodies of water above where the birds fly around, and two bodies of water beneath where the birds fly around. So I would say God put a water canopy around planet Earth before the flood. Now I know some creationists don't like that. Uh, there's a problem with heat, but there's the other problems too. And where would the other body of water be? I think Psalm 104 alludes to that, around the universe. God surrounded the universe with water. And so uh, Psalm 104, you can look that one up. So two bodies of water above would be the water above where the birds fly, and then the water around the atmosphere, around the whole works, and then two bodies of water beneath where the birds fly around would be the oceans and everything out here plus underneath. Because everywhere you go, you drill, what do you hit? Water, okay? So that's, I believe, the way it was. And that would have changed everything. That would have been, with, the, with that water canopy, earth would have been like pole to pole, greenhouse warm. Uh, it, they have palm tree fossils in Alaska. They have unfossilized broadleaf ferns in the Antarctica. How many of you knew that? See, there's all these evidences. You're not allowed to know. Earth was once pole to pole, greenhouse warm before the flood. Don't worry about Al Gore. Okay. <laughs> Uh, by the way, it's going to happen. It's going to get real hot again, but we're going to be around another thousand and seven years if we if we believe in the millennium and all that. Uh, that means animals could get huge. Everything is still eating green plants. Genesis chapter one verse thirty to the great beast of the earth. He said, "I've given you every green herb plant to eat." He didn't say you can eat meat until Genesis nine after the flood. That would have saved a problem for Noah. He didn't have to have freezers on the ark for the lamb or whatever to feed the lions. Everything is eating plants, including T-Rex, until after the flood. Now, there could have been some animals that defied God's decree. The, the curse had come and all that. So, dinosaur fossil bones, elastic tissue, red blood cells. You just saw the DVD on that. As a Mary Schweitzer, red blood cells in there. And uh, so am I saying dinosaurs and humans live together? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Well, didn't they go extinct 60 million years ago? No. They, when did God make dinosaurs? Same day he made Adam. Day six. Okay? So man and dinosaur have lived together since the beginning. Now, we may still have some dinosaurs around. They couldn't get as big because now after that water canopy came down, it's must, less atmospheric pressure and some different things. That's a whole other subject. But anyway, dinosaur and human footprints in Cretaceous rock, several places on Earth, including down in the Paluxy River at Glen Rose. 30 years ago, we had our, might have been 40 years, maybe 35 years ago, we had our feet in the human footprints. And some of the human footprints right down there in the Paluxy River, Glen Rose, there were people stepping in the dinosaur's prints. They were coming along behind the dinosaur, and it, like when you walk in the snow and you step in someone else's footprint right in front of you. Someone was doing that with a dinosaur going ahead of them. That had to be right there when all the flood stuff was happening. They're stepping in the mud, and maybe the waters were starting to come up. Anyway, they're, they're there. Now, the Park Service removed the human footprints. So I asked them why. Here a few years ago, we took a bunch down there. Well, you see, they said, the Park Service tells me this. It was confusing people uh, because they looked like human footprints. But we know humans and dinosaurs did not exist together. And we didn't want to confuse people, so we just took the human footprints out. But if you take one of those dinosaur footprints out, you go to jail, OK? See, we live in Satan's world system. And, and these people, they're honest people. That's all they know, you see? Cave paintings of dinosaurs. Rock paintings. How do you have a cave painting or a rock painting of a dinosaur if you never saw one? Okay? Dragon legends in every major culture. Giant reptile sightings still around the world. Okay, now down there on the bottom left, what is that? That one right there. Well, uh, you way up on top there, you, well, there's a man or two men, and then there's a horse with two people on it, and then there's an antelope head and probably an antelope, and then they get down to that, and oh, we don't know what that is. I guess that day he was just kind of scribbling on the rock. 
Well, could that have been in Montesaurus? Where was this? Grand Canyon, United States of America. Okay. They scraped off some of the, whatever they painted that with, that one's been highlighted, and they, they checked it for oxidation. And they said with oxidation, that painting is somewhere between six and 1,200 years old. Now what that means is, people living in the Grand Canyon 600 to 1,200 years ago were seeing these dinosaurs and painting their pictures. Now, if that makes your stomach churn and you're saying, no way, you believe the words of man. You believe Jurassic Park instead of the word of God, okay? Because God has dinosaurs and humans existing together from the beginning. And then you have over 50,000 of these Zika stones down in Peru. I've seen 12 originals. They're buried in the tombs. They dig them up out of the tombs. That one has maybe a Triceratops, maybe at the top right a Stegosaurus, maybe a Plesiosaur, maybe an Apatosaurus or Diplodocus on the left. They painted a Triceratops and they never saw one? You see, it doesn't even make sense, all right? They were seeing, matter of fact, they have one stone, it weighs almost two tons, it's huge. It has pictures on it of people riding dinosaurs, okay? You say, no way. Well, why would you say that? Because the Bible says man and dinosaur live together. It shouldn't be anything that surprises us at all. Oh, no, it was millions of years ago. That's when the dinosaurs walked the earth. No, it isn't. Now, are they in the Bible? Well, I think some of them are in the Bible. I think maybe the dragons it talks about several places in the Bible were dinosaurs. But anyway, this is uh, in Job chapter 40, about verse 15, 16. It talks about behemoth. It's a Hebrew intensive noun there. What's the side notes in the Bible say? Well, it's got to be an elephant or a hippopotamus. Well, why don't they say it could be a dinosaur? Well, because they're dinosaurs. Whoever wrote the side notes in this Bible, they didn't believe dinosaurs and humans existed together. Why? Because they believed the words of man instead of the word of God. All right, it's got to be an elephant or a hippopotamus. Let's just check that out, okay? Well, he eats grass. He's got a tail like a cedar tree. Does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? Let's get around behind an elephant. Is that a cedar? That's not a cedar tree. It's like a twig, okay? Uh, what about a hippo? There's a cedar tree, right? No, no. Now, is that a cedar tree? Yeah, but they don't look like that, do they? That's Dan Leith up there. At Answer. He used to be with Answers in Genesis. And so, I'm going to jump ahead now because I want to cover a few things tonight and make sure I cover them. All right, now, uh, dinosaurs and humans have existed together ever since the beginning. And they say, this one still lives in the Congo. There have been four expeditions in the last 25 years to go get them. Uh, nobody has yet. So I'm challenging some young people. You may have to become a Navy SEAL. You may have to get a PhD in reptiles. Go get us one. Okay, the people that live there say they're here, all right, deep in the, in the swampy jungles over there. All right, now we're going to go here. I got to do this. Okay, now, what about the days in Genesis? There is so much controversy over this. And so I thought, well, let's talk about it. We're just going to say, what does the Bible say? We go to the Bible to get the truth. So, how long are the days in Genesis? Well, first, how many of you believe in resurrection? You believe in resurrection? Okay. Um, all right, how many of you believe in virgin birth? That's almost everybody. Okay, if you don't believe in virgin birth, you don't believe in resurrection, you're not going to go to heaven, okay? But why do we believe in those things? Uh, we Christians believe in the virgin birth and the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, because uh, if we don't believe in that, we're not going to heaven. But why do we believe that? Well, because the Bible says so. But I can prove with science those things don't happen. We could lock up a whole room full of virgins nine months from now. Are they going to come out and be ready to have babies? No, we, that's, a, that's a scientific experiment. We can prove resurrection doesn't happen, right? Does anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> okay, nobody's volunteering. But you do believe in resurrection. Why? Because the Bible says so. 
Okay. Does modern science support virgin birth and bodily resurrection? No. So we Christians believe in things that go against modern science because we believe the Bible teaches it. So why do Christians not believe that the days in Genesis were normal days? Or why do Christians today say the earth is billions of years old? Or it was a local river overflow in the days of Noah. These are Christians, brothers of mine, sisters of mine. Okay? Couldn't the days of Genesis be indefinite long periods of time? Well, let's think about it. The Hebrew word there, yom. Anytime it occurs with a number, day one, day two, day three, it always means a regular day. Okay? That's how it appears in Genesis 1. Day one, day two. Each day in Genesis 1 was half light and half dark. So there's some sort of a, a light source either going around it or the earth is turning in front of it. But each day it tells us it's half light and half dark, Genesis chapter 1. Well, if a day is a billion years in Genesis chapter 1, and half of it is light, and half of it, that would mean you have 500 million years of darkness followed by 500 million years of unrelenting light. Things don't work that way, do they? In Genesis 1.14, so right in Genesis chapter 1, God is going to tell us what He means by the word day. He says, there were days, there were seasons, there were years in Genesis chapter 1. So if you say a day is equal to a billion years, how long is a season? You see, a season is 90 days long. Is a season 90 billion years long? If a day is equal to a billion years, how long is a year? You see, you can't do it just taking what the Bible says. You can't do that. You can't stretch those days into anything but normal days. All right, well, Adam was 930 years old when he died. Genesis chapter 5. Okay. At, let's say Adam lived half of day 6. He lived through the night between day 6 and day 7. He lived through all of day 7. A day equals a billion years in Genesis chapter 1. Was Adam uh, 1,500,930,000 years old when he died? See, you have all kinds of problems biblically when you take the words of man and try and superimpose it into the Bible. All right, Exodus 20, verse 9, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, what's, what's God say to people? Sixty days shalt thou labor, sixty days, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Okay, what kind of days are those? Does anybody know? He's talking to people. Does anybody here work for six billion years and then have a day of rest? No, we know what those days are. They're normal days. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Verse 11. For in six days, same Hebrew, the same kind of days you people work, God says, I worked, and within a six-day week, made up of the same kind of days you people work, I made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that in them is. God is saying right in the Ten Commandments, I worked a normal six-day week just like you do, and I created everything I made in that, in that six-day week. That's the same kind of days you people work. Well, you can't get any more clear than that. Well, then 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Maybe we ought to look at that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Actually, 2 Peter chapter 3 is really an interesting chapter. And uh, God's talking about judgments. Three judgments, okay? He's talking about the second coming judgment. People are going to scoff it, okay? By the way, you want to have some fun. Next time you're on a plane, turn to the person next to you and say, Hey, did you know Jesus is coming soon? And see what happens. <laughs> it's fun. Anyway, um, I did that once. <laughs> it was a, uh, a, a flight attendant on her way home, off duty. And uh, it's a long story, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive. <laughs> anyway, so it's the uh, second coming judgment. Then he talks about the flood judgment. Let's see. Let's go down to um, verse 4, saying this, Where is the promise of his coming? They're going to mock it. 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Oh, no, they don't. If there was a water canopy, they're not the same at all. Verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heaven, heaven of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's the first heaven and earth system. Pole to pole, greenhouse warm, okay? But the heavens and the earth, which are now, this present heavens and earth, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So this one is going to be destroyed by fire. And then he inserts a little paragraph, because that's scary. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're going to be judged. And that's scary. And it's coming. So he says, but, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. There you are. That proves it. Those days in Genesis could be any amount of time. It says right there, that day is like a thousand years. But look at the rest of the verse. And a thousand years as one day. So you just negated your argument. But the fact is, God isn't telling us what those days were in Genesis. He's telling us his heart. Now, how do we know? Well, look at the next verse. The Lord is not slack. These are time words concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to usward. A day is like a thousand years. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And on that day, if he waited a thousand years, it's like a day. He's telling us his heart. And then he gets right back to judgment again. Okay? So we can't use that to prove that um, those days in Genesis could be any amount of time. And uh, so, where do we go next? Uh, the genealogies. Some people say, well, yeah, but you know, there could be millions of years missing in the genealogical tables in the Bible. That's where we get this roughly 6,000 years is from the genealogical tables. There could be millions of years missing. Well, wait a minute. Even if there were millions of years missing, how's that going to help you put evolution in the Bible? Because the evolutionists say people were the very last thing to evolve. What are the genealogical tables? They're the tables of the generations of people. People are here. That would mean, if you're an evolutionist, all the other stuff has already happened. Okay? So it wouldn't matter how many millions of years, everything else had already happened. And then you get to Adam. But you can't have things living and dying before Adam. Because by Adam came death, Romans 5.12, among other things. Okay? All right, so genealogies from Adam to Abraham. There's nothing missing, by the way. Maybe 200 years at the most. A lot of studies have been done on that. Uh, from Adam to Enoch was seven generations. God tells us that in uh, Jude verse 14. So, and then Adam overlapped Lamech. Okay, so Adam would probably say, hey, uh, Lamech, great, 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 great grandson, I want to tell you something. I never should have eaten of that fruit. <laughs> well, Lamech then uh, has a grandson named Shem. And so, uh, before the flood, Lamech would say, hey, grandson Shem, come here. I want to tell you something. Your great, 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 great granddaddy Adam said, I never should have eaten of that fruit. Well, Shem comes through the flood, out the other end. And Shem overlapped Abraham by about at least 50 years. There are no huge gaps in the genealogical tables, okay? They are what we have, and they're accurate. So, they all knew each other back in those days. Uh, they lived in the same places. So are the days in Genesis then indefinite long periods of time, even a billion years each? Well, uh, the liberal theologians say, no, 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 that can't be a regular day. No way. It's got to be millions of years. Why? Because they've looked at what man says, like Lyell and his geology. Oh, yeah, it takes billions of years for all these rock layers to get laid down. No, uh -uh, you can do it in one year if you have a flood that covers the earth. All right. And then the biblical theologian would say, yeah, according to the language and context, day is a regular day, just a regular day. There's no, no uh, argument there. So how long were the three days in the fish and the three days in fasting for Jonah and Esther? Okay. Jonah was in the great fish three days and three nights. 
Was it three billion years? No, we know what those were. We don't even think about it. They were normal days. Esther fasted for three billion years. She was skinny when she finished. No, we know what those days are, don't we? There's no question. We know it. It's the same words in Genesis chapter 1. So why do we make Genesis chapter 1, that word day, mean something it never means anywhere else? Because we believe the words of man more than the word of God. And that's all we can say. The only place in the Bible that yom, the Hebrew word for day, with a numerical qualifier, day one, day two, that it does not mean normal day is when it's believed to mean an indefinite period of time in Genesis chapter 1. That's the only place. And you can't make it do that. Just Genesis 1 verse 14 is enough right there. So why is this? Well, it's what we've been talking about. We love the words of men. We just do. It appeals to our flesh. Well, did Jesus believe a literal Jonah was swallowed by a literal great fish? Some people say, well, that wasn't even a true story. That's just a, a, a something. Well, what did Jesus say? As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus believed it. So why don't some of us believe it? Well, I hope all of you do. Russ Miller, Creation Evolution Science, says this. If billions of years of death brought man into existence... There would have been no original sin that brought death into the world, resulting in separating us from our Creator. In turn, there would be no need for Jesus' redeeming sacrifice on the cross. Even if 90% of Christians who compromise God's Word with one of the various old earth philosophies don't realize it. I think that's a very good statement. So God says male and female people on earth from the beginning, Mark 10, verse 6. So which do you believe, you see? Do you believe people from the beginning, about 6,000 years ago, or do you believe people at the very end of a 15 billion year process with four and a half billion of that here on planet earth, and people evolved at the very end so which do you believe? Was it people at the beginning, like Jesus said? Or was it people at the very end, like evolution says? See, you, you, once you start thinking about these things, there's only one way we can go as Christians. So does the Bible refute evolution? The Lord Jesus, the Creator, refutes it. The molecules to man are billions of years. Here's what He says right there, Mark 10, 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, you know how some people get around that? Oh, well, he was talking about blue-green algae. He made blue-green algae from the very beginning, and then it evolved into people over millions of years. Well, is Jesus speaking of male and female blue-green algae in Mark 10, 6? No, he isn't. What's the context? Divorce. Have you ever met a divorced blue-green algae? No, he's talking people. People were here from the very beginning. And that's a comfort, because God did it, and He put us here, because He wanted to have a relationship with us from the beginning. Did the Lord Jesus create fully mature life forms? Okay. Day six, He makes Adam, okay? Now, Adam looks like maybe he's 20 years old, I don't know, 25, I don't know. He's walking around in the garden. I'm making this up. Michael the archangel comes walking over. Hey, uh, my name's Michael. Who are you? Oh, my name's Adam. Well, Adam, it's good to meet you. By the way, Adam, how old are you? Ten minutes. God just made me like I am ten minutes ago. Uh, God puts Adam to sleep, takes out a rib. By the way, progressive creationists now, Hugh Ross and, and those guys are now saying, oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't mean he took out a rib. That just means Eve was sourced in Adam. Well, then why does God say in Genesis 2 about verse 21, he had to close up the flesh. God took out a rib. He made Eve. Adam wakes up, sees Eve. Whoa, man, which is woman. He says, uh, Eve, how old are you? Ten seconds. God just made me 15 seconds ago, Adam, just like I am. 
Eve says, I'm hungry, Adam. Adam reaches up, picks a ripe peach, hands it to Eve. Adam, what a farmer. How long does it take to grow a tree like that? Three days. You can't grow a tree with ripe fruit in three days. No, but we have a God that can create fully mature systems instantly. Okay? Okay. Can God do that? Well, who is the creator? Jesus. Where does it tell us that? John 1? Colossians 1? Hebrews 1. We have a gold star in the back back there. <laughs> All right, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Jesus is the creator. So God the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through the agency of Jesus, created everything. So Jesus is the creator, which, by the way, gives him the right and the authority to be the Savior. All right, Jesus is going to come down to earth. He's going to do some miracles. What's his first miracle? Water into wine, John chapter 2. Okay, let's look at that. John chapter 2. Let's jump over there. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John chapter 2. And let's go down. Let's just go to verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone. This is the wedding feast at Cana. There were set there six water pots of stone. How many water pots? Six. Six. How many days in the creation week that he worked? Six. Six. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins each. This is King James. That's 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast. So take it to the head guy there. So they took it to him. Verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, oinos, by the way, that's the word for wine there, and knew not whence it was. So he didn't know where it came from, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning, at the beginning of the feast, Thus set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, why do they do that? You wouldn't know. This is a Christian group, right? Okay. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. How do you make good wine? You got to age it. How old is this wine? Hmm? Two minutes? Three minutes? How many water pots? Six. How many days in the creation week where he created fully mature systems? Six. Do you know Genesis, the, uh, the Septuagint Greek, which has some problems, but the Septuagint Greek in Genesis 1 parallels the Greek and thought of John chapter 1. Genesis 1, in the beginning. John chapter 1, in the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, man into marriage. John chapter 2, man into marriage. Genesis chapter 3, the fall, the sin. John chapter 3, the answer to the fall and sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have everlasting life, should not perish. All right. And by the way, you can go all the way to chapter 11, Genesis 1 through 11. And you can see the parallel thinking going all the way through the first 11 chapters of John. John is calling our attention back to what happened in the beginning. Okay, so, day six, Adam, fully mature. Dinosaurs, fully mature, day six. Eve, fully mature, one second after she's created from Adam's rib. Fruit trees, fully mature. Stars with light visible here on earth. God made it that way. What's, what's some of the evidence? All right, creator creates fully mature functional life forms and materials. Jesus' first miracle, water into wine, six pots, six days. He feeds 5,000 plus women and children. Hey, did he say, hey, guys, we're going to feed maybe 15,000 people. You better get some extra ovens out here. Let, let, we need about two tons of flour out here. No, instant baked Fish, dried fish, baked bread. If you would have eaten it, would it have tasted like it went through a time process? Yeah. If you didn't know where it came from, you would have think somebody baked that bread. Puts a ear back on Peter. Remember Peter? Whoop, I think the guy ducked. I think Peter aimed to talk, talk, take his head. 
And the guy goes, whoop, and Peter goes, whoop, and he gets his ear, okay? Jesus puts it back on. No scabs, no stitches, no healing. He doesn't need time. See, if we're going to believe the creation account as it's written, we have to believe we have a God that does not need time. Now, the question is, do you believe that? You see, Jesus proved it with his miracles. All right, so 2 Corinthians 4, what's it say? But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. I was. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Mine was, till I was 27. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Amen. Now, what about the flood? We've got time for a little of this. What about the flood of Noah's day? Was it a global flood or a local river overflow? Well, now we have an interesting thing. People who believe in the unbiblical idea, and it is unbiblical, excuse me, we, we stopped at Keller's for a cheeseburger <laughs> on the way over. It's been 40 years since we had a Keller cheeseburger. How many of you have had a Keller's cheeseburger? Oh, yeah, 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 it was good. Anyway, uh, people who believe in the unbiblical idea that the flood of the days of Noah was a local river overflow believe this way. Number one, theistic evolution. That was me when I first became a Christian. Some are called progressive creationists. That was the bunch that came after Hugh Ross. Day age, those days are a billion years each. The gap theory, yeah, people lived and died before Adam came and before there was any sin and death. That can't be. The framework hypothesis, all of these require a local river overflow in millions of years and death before Adam sinned, if you think it through. You can't have them if we're going to believe what the Bible says. All right, the flood of Noah's day. So many today are saying it was a local river overflow confined to the Mesopotamian Valley. And they say, well, we have found the shoreline of that ancient flood of Noah's day. Genesis 7, 19, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills of the Mesopotamian Valley that were under the whole Mesopotamian Valley were covered. That's not what it says, is it? All the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. That is a global flood. Oh, no, it was local. Okay, then look out, Adam, you're going off. See, now God can do that. He did it twice. Okay, he did it to the Red Sea, he did it to the Jordan. That's not how he describes it in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. It was not a local river overflow. Now, why did so many Christians say it was a local river overflow? Because the evolutionists said there never could have been a flood that covered the whole earth, and they believed the words of man instead of the word of God. That's how that originated. Well, now what are the evolutionists starting to say? Uh-oh. Here's one. We're talking about a time when if you were looking at the earth from space, you would hardly see any land mass at all. It would have almost been an ocean world. Okay, now here's another evolutionist. However, some recent studies suggest water may have covered the earth's entire surface for some 200 million years before the continents emerged. Now, his timing is way off. But now the evolutionists, with now able to take pictures from out in space and different things, they are now saying, whoops, it looks like Earth was once covered with water. So what are the progressive creationists going to do that followed Hugh Ross, who followed the evolutionists when they said... Earth could not have been covered by water. Now the evolutionists are saying, hey, it looks like Earth was once covered with water. See, if we just stick with the Bible, it'll save us all kinds of embarrassment and everything else. Just stick with God's Word. We can believe it. We can trust it. Fossils of sea creatures are found on the tops of the highest mountains. Their continent, and by the way, they were raised up during the flood and shortly after the flood. The ocean bottoms were dropped down. Uh, Psalm tells us about that. The continents are all covered with thousands of feet of sedimentary rock. Could it be? The oceans once covered them. Yeah. Think about it. Perhaps Noah's flood is really true. Yeah, it is. It really is. It's true. One of the evolutionists' prime examples of evolution in action is dog evolution. 
Okay, Scientific American, we can trust it, right? It's a science magazine. No, it's a propaganda magazine. March 1, 2005, there are hundreds of breeds of dogs and they're all genetically derived from one pair of Eurasian wolves. Michael Shermer says, just observing all the breeds of dogs proves evolution is true. This is one of their greatest proofs that evolution is true, the evolution of the dog. And they believe with female mitochondrial DNA, they have traced the first dog couple back to an ancient Eurasian wolf pair. And all the rest of the dog breeds came from that ancient Eurasian wolf pair. Now, I would say, if that's true, they just support what God says. What did he say? I took a male and a female of every kind of animal, okay? So, maybe he took a male Eurasian wolf and a female Eurasian wolf, because the evolutionists tell us all dog breeds came from those two. But what do they say? This is evolution in action. This is evidence for evolution. Is it? You see, what happened? To have real evolution occur, information would have had to be added to the Eurasian wolf's genes, like, for instance, poodle information. To go from a wolf to Fifi the poodle, it would have to have information added. That's not what happened information dropped out. That's just the opposite of evolution. Now, how do we know information dropped out? Because you can't take a poodle and selectively breed it back to a wolf. The information is gone. And you can't add information to a gene anyway. Information is non-material. You can't grab information out of the air and stick it in a gene. You can't take a gene and pull information out. It's non-material. All the information in every single genome of every single living thing had to have been supernaturally put in there by God himself at the beginning of that particular creature. Okay, so um, here's a syllogism I put up on college campuses when it gets raucous and they're booing and hissing and yelling and calling me a stupid old man and it's all noisy. So I just put this up. Language is caused by intelligence. No one disagrees. DNA is language. Yeah, the evolutionists say it's the language of the cell. So language is caused by intelligence. DNA is language. Therefore, DNA had an intelligent cause. Silence. It does. It just goes to silence every time. Praise God. All right, now what is this? Now, we've got the ape on the left. We've got Uncle Harry on the right. What are those three in the middle? That's called art. Okay, <laughs> it is. How, how do we know? Because Science Digest told us in an article on Anthropological art, in other words, the study of man, anthropos, using art, all right? Unfortunately, it says, the vast majority of artists' conceptions are based more on imagination than evidence. That's those three in the middle. That's imagination of the artist. Much of the reconstruction, however, is guesswork. That's those three in the middle. It's guesswork. Bones say nothing about the fleshy parts of the nose, lips, or ears. Have you ever found a bone with a lip on it? How do they know what the lip looked like? Well, what's it say? Artists must create something between an ape and a human being. That's the three in the middle. By the way, this magazine, uh, Science Digest, was so anti-creationist. I, I had a subscription. I canceled it. I just couldn't stand reading it anymore. Now they've gone defunct. The older a specimen is said to be, the more ape-like they make it. See? That's the artist. Oh, they tell me that one's going to be uh, many, many thousands of years old. It's got to look more like an ape. So that's what they draw. Hairiness is a matter of pure conjecture. Have you ever found a bone with hair on it? How do they know what the hair looked like? How do they know what that hair looked like on all those three in the middle? They don't have any hair on any of their bones, okay? That's what he's saying. We have to make it up. We just kind of make it up. We imagine what it might be, and that's what we do. This is Satan's world system. It's based on deception. The guesswork approach often leads to errors. Yeah, I, sh I should say so. 
It really does. Okay, now uh, I have time for just a couple questions that I'm going to ask. Okay, a few questions, okay? Because these always come up, so I'm just going to touch on them, okay? Just touch on them. All right. Are there not two different creation accounts between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2? Comes up all the time. No. Genesis 1 is the macro view of the creation week. Genesis 2 is the micro. It focuses in on day 6 and things that were going on and some domestic plants and different things with Adam. Okay, so no, it's not two different creation accounts. And uh, what about this? Where did Cain get his wife? Well, he got his wife from his sister or his cousin. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Genesis chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. So he married a sister or a cousin. It was okay back then. When did God say, okay, from now on, you don't marry your sister. You don't marry your cousin in the law of Moses. So all the way up until the law of Moses, God did not have any decree that says you can't marry a close relative. But he put it down in the law of Moses. And sons and daughters to Adam and Eve. Doesn't Gilgamesh's flood account predate the biblical account? The answer is no. Okay? Now, this is a fascinating theory, the tablet theory. And Henry Morse gets into that. I think it's his long war against God. He gets into this really well. But there are these different, it says, and the generations of, and the generations of, and it names them. There were different authors of those first 11 chapters of Genesis, all the way through Genesis. Different authors, different tablets were made. I think Moses had access. I think those tablets were re, were preserved, and Moses had them. Because when he gets to Exodus verse 1, he changes the routine of how those words got there, because now Moses is writing it, instead of people like Shem, and Adam, and Noah. And so uh, I, I left a thumb drive with your church that has all of this on it. So if you want to go study that, I've got them all listed right there. Uh, you can study it. All right, now what else? If God knows everything, why did he not stop Adam and Eve from sinning? Well, God placed his first two humans in a perfect environment, didn't he? Only one restriction. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you're going to die physically, spiritually. So he created man with volition. We can make choices. You made a choice tonight to come here. You could have stayed home and eaten popcorn and watched TV, but you came here, right? You, had, you made a choice. You have volition. Well, Adam and Eve were granted volition, ability to choose God's way or the way of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. They chose lust of the flesh. They chose to rebel against God, satisfy the lust of the flesh. I think Eve could have taken and eaten of that fruit and Adam says, nope, we're not doing that. And I think God would have rescued Eve. It's like he says back there in Exodus, uh, if uh, uh, a woman, a man does something to a woman, and the father says, sorry, even though she was supposed to marry the guy or he was supposed to die, the father says, no way. Just, and she made a vow. No, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to keep that. Okay, I think Adam could have said, come on, come on, Eve, we're getting out of here. He could have said that before they ate, but he didn't. All right, God wants us to choose and to love him above all else. Adam flunked the test. And we have the results of that right down to today. Is it, it, it impossible to get all those animals on the ark? Well, I, just ask two questions when somebody says that to you. Oh, you stupid Christian, look at all the animals, look at them, millions... No way they could get them on the ark. Just ask two questions. First say, how big was the ark? They don't know. How many animals would he have to take to give us all the kinds of animals we have today? They don't know. So you're making a statement here that he couldn't do it, and you don't even know how big it was or how many, how many animals would have to go on the ark. Well, we know how big it was, and you can go see a copy of that up there at uh, Answers in Genesis in uh, Kentucky. 
How many animals? Well, the biggest number I've ever seen is 35,000 kinds, and now they've done a lot of study on that, and it's probably closer to 3,500 kinds of animals. You could get all those on one deck, by the way, in that ark. Probably brought young animals. They wouldn't, uh, they would live longer. They wouldn't eat as much. Maybe some of them hibernated a good part of the time, or estivated. Hibernation, sleep in winter, estivation, sleep in summer. God put a could have put a lot of them to sleep. Uh, we don't know. He doesn't tell us. No, it didn't need freezers of meat on the ark for the lions or for T-Rex because everything is still plant. All he, had, all he needed was hay, and they could have survived, okay? Doesn't Archaeopteryx prove dinosaurs evolved into birds? Nope. Now they have found true bird fossils that predate Archaeopteryx. See, that, that's what I was taught when I went to college. Oh, that's the missing link. Well, you would have to have thousands of missing links to go from a dinosaur to a bird in any event, but now they've, it's a bird, Archaeopteryx is a bird, according to the evolutionists, okay? If humans coexisted with dinosaurs, where are all the human fossils? Well, that's a good question. Humans would have been the last ones to go, I'm sure. They were climbing up on log mats and anything they could find, and, and uh, they, they were probably the, the last ones to go. That's why we don't find very many, although there probably were several million people on earth at that time. Genesis 6 through 8 describes that worldwide flood, but in Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel and the dispersing of people into various language groups and geographical locations. Have you thought about that when God changed the language? He changed their memories in their brain into their new language because husbands and wives could talk to each other. They knew each other, okay? What kind of a God do we have? Unbelievable. And then he thought up all these languages. And I mean, we go places, we can't speak the language. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Doesn't carbon dating prove the earth is billions of years old, fossils millions of years old? Well, first of all, carbon dating only works on organic material, like a fossil bone. And carbon dating is only really accurate for a few hundred years. Here's a problem. Earth's, the strength of Earth's magnetic field determines how much carbon-14 is formed in our atmosphere. The stronger Earth's magnetic field, and it is stronger the further back you go, they've been measuring it now for about 150 years, it's, it's decreasing in strength about 5% a year, okay? The farther back you go, the stronger is Earth's magnetic field. What does it do? It acts like a shield around planet Earth to shield us from harmful radiation that has to get into the atmosphere to irradiate the nitrogen-14 to convert it to carbon-14. I think it bounces off a neutron, if I remember. So carbon-14 is formed from nitrogen-14 because of this radiation that gets in. Well, water filters out almost 100% of that kind of radiation. So if there was a water canopy around planet Earth before the flood, almost no carbon-14 would have been formed. So you dig up a fossil bone like a dinosaur, and you say, oh, there's no carbon-14. It must be millions of years old. No. What if there wasn't any carbon-14 to begin with? You see, there's all kinds of assumptions that are made when people date all these things. And we're going to get to a lot more on that next week. So. Uh, we'll just go here. Uh, two more. Doesn't Genesis 1.28 in the King James say, replenish, right, multiply, and replenish the earth? That's a bad translation of that word. I use King James, okay? Uh, what, usually, that word is translated, be full, to fill, to make full, to fill up, multiply, and fill the earth. That was the command. And then it's given to Adam, and then it's given again to Noah after the flood. Now, multiply and fill the earth, Noah. Okay? By the way, you want to know something? You get to the New Testament. Does it ever say that in the New Testament? No. We're under a different system now. What is it now? Go and make disciples. Okay? That's what it says. That's what we're to be doing. Go and make disciples. And my time has gone away. So, I am going to stop with, I have to stop with something. 
Okay, let's just stop right here. God won't share his glory. Evolution robs God of his glory. It, God says, I will not give my glory to another. Isaiah 48, 11. Evolution robs God of his glory. It steals his praise. The whole purpose of evolution. What is it? Get rid of God. Get rid of Genesis. Get rid of the Bible. I read you some of those quotes last time, right? I thought I did. Did I? Anybody remember? I did. Okay. Christian, are you believing the words of men, evolution, or the Word of God? That's what we're thinking about. Next week, we're going to look at some of the evidences for a young earth, and we're going to look at some ways to use creation in evangelism. And uh, so let's all pray that we'll all be back, and we'll trust our Lord to help me say what needs to be said next week, because I was going to get there this week. And I didn't make it. So I'll pray. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together. Now, please get everybody safely back to where they live. And uh, bring us back next week uh, excited about you, our great and glorious Creator and Savior. Lord Jesus, thank you that you provided for us a way to have our sin dealt with by your death taking our sin on you on the cross and your resurrection which proved it was satisfying to God. And if someone needs Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they will get that straightened out once and for all, so we can all have the joy of the Lord together in Jesus' name. Amen.